A very good morning to each one of you present here. We are here to start our session on endophthalmitis. So for your benefit, we have brought some handouts of this session. So all the recent outlines and guidelines and protocols that you need to follow is right here in front of you. So those of you who want to collect the handout, you can take one copy from here. It is over the sound box right here in the right side. So our course is on endophthalmitis, recent protocols and guidelines. I'm Dr. Hemanthi Chaudhary from Silchar, Assam. Our first speaker is Dr. Shatangshu Mathur, who will be talking on pre-operative, per-operative, and post-operative preventive measures to avoid endophthalmitis. He is the chief consultant of High Tech Eye Institute and Laser Center, Kashipur, Uttarakhand. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Imadri. We all know we have done a good cataract surgery, but if the end is not well, all is not well. So there are five possible factors alone or in combination for this dreaded disease. Patient personal hygiene, contaminated surgical supplies, faulty sterilization procedures, and advert touch and environment. If we can take care of these five things, we can have zero endothermitis. And that is the aim of my talk, March to zero endothermitis. What are the preoperative risk factors? We all know. But what happens when we go for the surgery? We forget about it. We are in a hurry to operate. Do not worry what is going on behind the scene. So we should take care. There should be no nephritis no conjunctivitis, no lack of mental obstruction, and eyelid abnormalities, entropy and acceptance should be taken care. If patient diabetes, we should control the diabetes first, then we should operate. And thorough preoperative clinical assessment of the patient is very important. Investigation, what we should mandatory for do, that is a, whatever I am going to tell you, it is the AIOS and ESCRS recommendations. You can quote this recommendation in the court of law, you will be saved. Many doctors have been saved by this uh, guidelines in the court. Blood sugar less than 120, and fasting and random less than 200, you are safe in the court. If about this, something wrong happens, then you can be liable for the penalty. Changing should not be done on the same day, we all know about it. What preoperative medication and instruction should be given to the patients? They should use broad spectrum antibiotics four to six times a day, a day before surgery, if you are doing in the morning, or on the date of surgery, if you are doing in the evening. Patients should burn clean clothes, should have a, male should come with a shave, everything, so that day the hygiene is there. Main important thing is the instruction to the staff. If biometry has to be done on the same day, Use immersion method, never do by the contact method. And if you have a page list of 10 patients, should operate the diabetic patient first. You should operate the single eye patient first. How to prepare the patient? We should clear the broke region, the dead margin, with 10% iodine. We should not clear only the eyelid margin. We should, from the forehead to the, up to the nose, we should clean all the area or this side. Then, Iodine 5% two times topically, five minutes before surgery is more important, more useful than using broad spectrum antibiotic a day before surgery. No need to use broad spectrum antibiotic a day before surgery. If you put iodine 5% two times before the surgery, five minutes before surgery. These are things common. We should use the glass properly ground. Then scrubbing is a very important part. We should have a chart over the scrubbing area, not for you, but for your staff, your assistant to know that he has to scrub for five minutes. I have seen many, doc many, 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 100% doctor I can say, they do not scrub for five minutes. Hardly one and two minutes and then can go the, in the OT. Ideally, we should scrub for four to five minutes and fit the proper conditioning with provided iodine liquid scrub. Proper gloves technique. Draping is very important. When we are draping, we should give one minute time. Normally, draping is done by assistant. 
So we should train him how to drape. Eyelashes should be not outside but inside the drape. And that's why trimming of lashes is not required nowadays. Monitoring surgical supply. We should check expiry date and packing whether intact or not of all supplies which are going to be used in the OT. Check clear main culprit in the infection most cases is the irrigating fluid. So you should always up and down put the bottle and see if there is any foreign body, is a particle inside the bottle or not. Ideal is one irrigating bottle for one patient but it is not possible in India. So we should use two, three, in total two, three cases and then we should avoid it. Now it is 100 ml bottle are available so we can dispose it. Faco sleeve and tip should be changed after each case. If you can do it, it is better. There is little evidence that using antibiotic in irrigating fluid during surgery can reduce the risk of infection. So we have avoided using it nowadays. Subconjunctive antibiotic given at conclusion of surgery have been found to be reduced risk of antithermity. Normally we give gentamicin. Intercamer injection, it is a very long study by Dr. Haripriya in the Arvind Hospital and they have proved that anticrime injection is very useful. At least in high risk cases, we should always give it. They, our incision should be watertight. If it is not watertight, we should not hesitate in putting a suture there. If there is a complication like PC rupture, we should do it at, at any cost. There should be no vitreous tag on the wound area. Extraction is very important. High speed autoclave, and then if you do not have high speed autoclave, then you should have adequate number of surgical sets to do this. Autoclave is covered by some other partners, so I am skipping it. Important thing autoclaving is we should maintain the temperature, not only temperature, but how long it has stand in the right time. It will be covered by the speaker. Then monitoring of the autoclave is very important. So we have different types of sterilizer, physical and chemical and biological indicators. Physical indicator that we put outside the drum, black, that turn the black, this only indicate that you have achieved the required temperature. But it is for the adjustable time that we give 30 minutes, 40 minutes, it has reached it has stayed there for 30 minutes or not, we are not sure by this physical indicator. So for that, we have chemical indicators, type 5 indicators, we have time, this is a color changes so that we can know that this is a session is complete. We have type 6 indicator that also change the color and we should put these indicators, not one but two or three in the different, if we are having different boxes inside the autoclave. So this standard tell us that we have achieved a 100% isolation. This is the most important thing if we want zero endothematis. Biological indicator also very useful. That is not for the instrument, but for the, for the isolation of the autoclave we are using. So it should be used once in a month. And then we should keep record of, the important thing is of, we should keep the record of everything, indicate, this indicator, whatever you have used, you should put a stick on the register with the date and time, that will save you in the court of law. Cleaning of OT is very important, remove the dust with a clean very close, OT floor, trolley, this all should be clean. There are different solutions available nowadays for this, basilocyte is Angelconium chloride plus ethylene dioxide glutaldehyde. It can be used for nowadays we are using D125. This is third generation ammonium compound for surface disinfectant and mopping and fogging. D256 is sixth generation ammonium compound that is also used for the cleaning. The cleaning of OT is very important. We should keep floor clean and do not discard soil linen. Or do not flow your gown, everything on the operation center floor. Floor should be always very clean. Walls and ceiling are rarely contaminated. They can be clean every 15 days. Fumigation of OT is not required nowadays. At, the, at least we should not do it in carcinogenic. So the solution that we are using, D125, can be used for the mopping and fogging. Cleaning of, ideally this 
yes, uh, this type of AC is not allowed in the OT. This, uh, but if you are using this type of AC, you should clean the filter of AC once a week daily. Microscope head, phaco corti, they all should be cleaned by chlorhexidine gluconate solution. You can make the solution 10 ml diluted in 5 ml of water and clean the instrument daily. OT layout involvement will be covered by another another OT layout will be covered by the other person, so I'm not. But main th one thing I would like to say, OT area should be to, uh, should be separate from the OPD area and anti should be restricted in the OT area. And culture sensitive from the OT area should be always taken once in a month and you should keep a record in your book that your OT culture was taken on this date and it was a slice. OT is planned always with the zoning. We have four type of zone, prototic, clean and slide, covered by the other persons. These are zones. Ventilation is very important. We should have center condi air conditioning or split AC, window AC are not allowed. If you have AHU with HEPA it is very good. Laminar air flow should be 20 to 30 cycle per hour. And parameter for OTR temperature 20 to 24 degrees centigrade and humidity 50 to 60 degree. This, uh, water tank is a very, nobody go and see the water tank, nobody see go up uh, on the top of the hospital and see the water tank. But water can is the most difficult area to treat if there is a contamination. So we should clean once in a month and we should also keep the record of it in the, in the our record so that we have clean. So these, these are the daily checklist you can note down. Who checked periodic checklist, who checked autoclave, who filled the glove. This should be our checklist not for doctor but for your staff that they are aware and they are conscious. We get that checklist signed by our OT staff after the surgery and that signed by, countersigned by me. I never see it, sign it, but they are not aware that I am not seeing it. So they are very punctual about the things. So for the staff, you should have daily list. These are who did cleaning, mopping before surgery, who cleaned equipments. They should sign it, who is the responsible person. Something wrong happens, he will be held liable for this. Then weekly checklist with the date and time, who admitted article report, who done the cleaning of the instrument or shifting of the instrument. So everything is documented and signed by the nursing staff after the OT and by the consulting doctor. Who cleaned AC instrument, who cleaned instruments, these all things. Then expiry of date of medicine should always be checked before any OT. Whenever you start OT, we ship five or six viscoelastic, we always check the date of this thing. So all the dates should be checked. This is a monthly checklist, soft sample culture is taken or not taken, IOL stock we check, date of expiry before opening any IOL, you should check the date of expiry. This case happened in Delhi once, that expired lens was implanted and the chit was given to the patient and the doctor was held responsible for it. So if you take all this care, you will have a smile of this type on your patients. Otherwise, you will have a very anger phase of the patient if the end happens. So be careful. You can achieve the zero endothematis. We are getting it for the last three years, and you can also get it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Satang Shumathur. For, I would like to mention once again, for your convenience, we have also included this checklist in this handout, which will be available with uh, me right after this IC is over. Our next speaker is Dr. Deepak Mishra. He is the Associate Professor, BHU, and he is also the Chairman, ARC of Uttar Pradesh Society of Ophthalmic Surgeons. He will be talking on clinical diagnosis and differential diagnosis with TAS. First of all, I would like to thank Mandi for including me his IC. Uh, the topic she has given to me is how to differentiate end of thalmatis with TAS. There is no financial interest. First of all, we all have to know why to differentiate. The differentiation is very much important because we have know that both are common usually after the cataract surgery, but there are many other surgery in which we got the similar situation, but they have a different etiology. Clinical picture is looking just like same, but etiology is different. 
requires different treatment and even prognosis is different so these are the something which looks like a twin brothers but have lot of differences in between them and of thalmitis i am not going in detail as dr mathur sir already explained we all that what are the types and how we know about the end of thalmitis but for this i would like to say just note down or have a some idea about the time period if it occurs within four days it is a permanent type and most common organism involved is strepto and staph if it is acute by the epidermidis or the fungi is not acute uh, common in acute but it is common in the delayed so it may occur after the four weeks sometimes that's why the most of the surgeons have a protocol to follow their cases on day 1 day 7 and day 28 just for these delayed end of thalmitis for the treatment is concerned there are many aims and objective for treatment our future speakers will tell them but the primary objective for any treatment of end of thalmitis is to control or eradicate the infection manage the complication and restore the vision and secondary objective is whatever we can see if our globe or symptomatically relief now coming to the task task is the something which is uh, done which is also inflammation but it is an sterile type of inflammation and the common causes associated with this is cleaning and sterilization failure somewhere sometimes because of the ivel solutions ointments and drop dr mathur sir wonderfully explain what are the cleaning protocols for ot and everything so we can do also i am not going in details how we can prevent this thing now coming to the main topic what is the clinical differentiation between both tas and endophthalmitis so first difference is the onset tas is usually you have to see in or anyone can see in within 48 hours means within 2 days however the end of thalmitis earliest of the end of thalmitis features occurs after 72 hours so if you seen just after 6 hours or 12 hours or 24 hours means there is more chances of tas as compared to end of thalmitis second is pain pain is important feature if any patients call you after cataract surgery that he is having lot of pain it is not a simple pain means heavy pain then you can say intolerable pain then the, it is more chances it goes towards end of thalmitis however the tas have mild reaction and mild pain too then coming to the discharge discharge in tas is usually a watery discharge however in the end of thalmitis since it is a infection somewhere so it is a purulent here you can see the lid congestion here the lid congestion is of lesser uh, types but in the end of thalmitis just see how severe lid congestion is now coming to the anterior chamber reaction when you can see the anterior chamber reaction since end of thalmitis is mostly because of the posterior segment involvement or the end of thalmitis in anterior segment so here you can find out less hypopion but in case of tas you will find out fibrin or the smaller hypopion now this is the most uh, i can say Uh, not most but the most commonly feature which anyone can identify with by uh, sitting on simple on a slit lamp in the case of tas you have seen here from limbus to limbus whole limbus either right or left you can vertical or horizontal 360 degree limbal to limbal corneal edema is seen in the cases of tas but when we see end of thalmitis it is usually localized or in some segment initially later on it will move anywhere so limbal to limbal corneal edema or the full corneal involvement as an edematous cornea is important feature of tas another one is the iop iop usually if it is a real tas it may be normal to high and for end of thalmitis may be normal or low so iop is not a much differentiating feature as compared to limbal to limbal edema but yes when you are able to see the fundus then there will be a clear cut differentiation that in cases of tas you have seen the whole fundus is normal and clear but when it is a end of thalmitis then there is chances of vitreitis or vitreous haze so that you can have a different feature so one we can say is the 
next one is the diagnosis and the diagnosis for the tasks you have to until unless it is proved uh, proven by the culture and sensitivity treat all sometimes we advise that treat all tasks as endophthalmitis until unless it is proved by that uh, culture and sensitivity so culture and sensitivity is important in both if not responding these are the treatment if anything is having in task then intensive steroid or different treatment but in cases of endophthalmitis uh, my uh, next speaker will going to deal about all these things so i am skipping this slide just a take home message for regarding the differentiation most time is one is the onset onset if it is less than 48 hours or more than 3 to 4 hours corneal edema limbal to limbal are localized anterior chamber reaction less in task where is more vitreitis we have find out that is uh, fundus is normal in cases of task but when we go for this one endophthalmitis then there is vitreitis or the haze and culture and sensitivity is important so all these parameters anyone can have in mind while differentiating all th these two similar things with this i again say there is no substitute of clinical examination as long as you are going to take the proper history do the sterilization and check your sterilization protocol anytime either it happens tars or endophthalmitis with these words i would like to thank you thank you doctor if any question i am here or we can Dr. Deepak, wonderfully presented. I think all of you know that we have had TAS recently all over the country. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to differentiate between TAS and endophthalmitis. So one thing which you must remember is TAS is because of a non, it's a one-time event. It is because of a non-infectious substance. Because it is non-infectious substance, it is non-progressive. Endophthalmitis is because of an infection, which means it's an organism which is going to multiply and hence it will be progressive. progressive. Very true. Sir. So if you if you if you remember these two facts, you will understand that what Deepak said that TAS can occur within first 12 to 24 hours. Why? Because it is by non-infectious substances which have entered the eye at the time of surgery, so surgical intervention. Therefore, it will present earlier. While if an endophthalmitis is there, it is going to present a little later, which may be as early as 24 hours, some cases of pseudomonas infections, they can present virtually the next day, but usually, as Deepak said, they present within first two, three days or even later than that. So that is there. The other difference which is important to remember because TAS presents 12 to 24 hours, you may have a limbus to limbus edema, the corneal edema. While in end of, it may be localized to a particular quad. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful insight. Next, we have Dr. Himanti. She will be talking about OT layout, sterilization, and staff training. Good morning, everybody. So I'll go straight to my topic. That is about OT sterilization and layout. So just as Dr. Arora was speaking about the recent outbreak of uh, TAS, so AIO is always keeps on giving us guidelines on uh, whatever recent is happening and the guidelines actually keep on increasing or changing or evolving as newer science keeps adding and newer literature is published or newer evidence is published in the literature and we have to keep up to date with whatever is happening and whatever needs to be done for prevention of intraocular infection. So these are some of the recent guidelines which came up. Some are old and uh, some are the new ones. And this is the latest read. It is a very good read which came in IJO 2022 about a task force that was formed and they have given all the guidelines how to prevent intraocular infection. 
and also cluster outbreaks. So first and foremost, why at all do we need a layout system? It is because we want most of the hospitals want an approval from uh, professional bodies like the NABH. It can help us to provide better service to the patients. It improves the quality and image of the hospital. On the long run, it also saves on maintenance cost, a HR cost, and of course, it will also safeguard us from medical negligence. So this needs to be dealt with under two headings, that is the infrastructural and engineering control, which actually starts prior to the construction of an OR, and the managerial control comes after the OR is constructed. So when you are planning an OT, the location of the OT should be at has a functional segregation from the OPD. Preferably, it should be at a top floor if your OPD is in a ground floor. And it should also have a segregation from the laboratory and from inpatient. Uh, it should be, of course, the materials should be long-lasting, easy to maintain, resistant to microorganism, and it should be in such a place where movement of patient will be limited. Only the patient who are going to the OR will go there and not all the other patients. And traditionally, the OT needs to be in four zones. Number one zone is the protective zone, which will have the changing room, your staff rooms, and the storage things needs to be there. Then clean zone is the intermediate zone between the protective zone and the aseptic zone. Aseptic zone is the sterile zone where the OT proper is where you operate. And the disposal zone is where you do the hazardous waste and reprocessing of all the equipments are done there. So this is how a protective zone looks like, the intermediate clean zone and the aseptic or sterile zone. Coming to ventilation, the AIOS has not given a straightway recommendation that we must have a HEPA filter because still now there is no consensus on the, having a HEPA filter, but this is for certain that we cannot and cannot have a fan, we cannot have a window AC, but we can have a split AC where the AC filters need to be cleaned weekly and the engineer should come and do the servicing once in a month. And air exchange should be done for those who can have the air handling unit. This is an added advantage. Coming to the water tank, already mentioned by my previous speaker that an IOT should have a separate water tank and it need not be the one that your indoor patients or your outdoor patients are using. It should have a preferably maybe a small one so that it can be cleaned monthly once and this the water also needs to be treated at the user end. When I say treated at the user end, I mean that our standard protocol is first washing with soap and then with 7% providon iodine cleansing solution. This will be followed by cleansing with AquaGuard water treatment at user end and finally with alcohol-based rub that is sterilium. So what are the minimum standards as recommended by NABH? It is size of the OT 260 square feet, but AIOS has reduced this size. It can be 160 square feet, provided the number of persons inside the OR is limited to four. Humidity needs to be maintained at 40 to 60, temperature 21 plus minus three degrees. Air handling unit, as I have already said, Positive pressure should be maintained if possible. Occupancy, I have already told, preferably keep it to four and below, and lighting should be one kilowatt. Floor surfaces of the OT preferably should be tiles so that it is non-porous, seamless, and it can be easily cleaned day after day. The OT walls and doors, doors should be self-sealing, which should have a door closer so that your OT nurse don't have to keep it open and you can just push with your back and go in. 
and the walls should be dust proof moisture proof the lights should be good and since we are dealing with all the costly machines feco vitrectomy machine so it should preferably have a separate power circuit with a usb backup Modular OT for those who can afford it is great because this is engineered with guaranteed performance and it has a shorter erection time and vertical laminar flow is present. This is the fourth zone where we are doing the reprocessing. It has a wash basin, a discharge table where you are cleaning all your instruments. Coming to the sterilization of instrument, we still have to give the highest amount of importance to sterilization of instrument because the major source of infection are our instruments. So proper processing and reprocessing of these instruments cannot be overemphasized. So ideally you should have two set of OT nurses, one set who will be assisting you in your cases and the second set who will be doing the cleaning process because this has to start immediately, not after your whole OR is finished. It's not then that you go and tell your sisters to do the OT cleaning. Preferably it should have started immediately and what we do is we separate the sharp and blunt instrument and you will note in the this video here, these are uh, needle holders and corneal scissors which have a posterior lock. Someone we open that lock so that you get access to this joint here and this joint should be cleaned with a soft bristle brush. And we come from an area where the humidity is very high, so we always dry our instruments because any amount of moisture left usually gives rise to rusting and the life of your uh, instruments come down. After this cleaning, we do processing in ultrasonic cleaner. And then the instruments are double dipped in cetrimide and chlorhexidin solution and then again dipped in distilled water. Now these are some of the sharp instruments where you will note the tip is covered with a silicon sleeve and these are the instruments which are kept for drying and then we arrange them in sets of stainless steel like FACO sets or glaucoma sets. Now coming to processing of hollow instruments, by hollow instrument I mean the bimanual irrigation aspiration cannula. These sometimes have to be autoclaved in between cases because if you have a long list of cases and your IA cannulas are maybe three pairs or four pairs then you need to have them re-sterilized again. So this should be done by hollow, by syringe of 60 cc syringe and the flushing should be done by distilled water and not just any RL or tap water because it is recommended by the manufacturer of the machine that distilled water should be used for cleaning. So three times you do the cleaning first, the water cleaning with distilled water cleaning thrice and then air cleaning with thrice again and then this gets ready for autoclaving. Packaging of the instrument, packaging are different for steam autoclave and for ethylene oxide. We have ethylene oxide ETO in our hospital because we have uh, lots of tubings and lenses that needs to be cleaned. So for packaging usually it is done like this in the left video and you will note that the autoclave tape has been put here and in the tape the OT nurse needs to write down the date when this was packed and then it will go to the autoclaving and the color needs to change. This packing is done for ETO. You will note these are rolls. We can cut them customized according to our size of the instrument that we need to do ETO and then we seal it. It is of course a two packet, a double packet needs to be done and while we are taking it for the OT trolley, one packet will be opened and with the pack, second packet it comes to our trolley. So what are the sterilization method? Autoclaving, when we speak of autoclaving, horizontal autoclave is the preferred one where we can uh, sterilize linen and metallic instrument and it should be used within 48 hours. In between cases also autoclaving can be done but of course there is a plasma grade class B sterilizer or plasma sterilizer which can be used. 
chemical sterilization is now not recommended by AIOS in all the recent guidelines and in the IGO article that published in 2022, it is not recommended. Coming to ETO sterilizer, how it is done. For ETO, the instrument that we use are the heat labile instrument like the tubings, phaco probes, cryo probes, and it takes a running time of six hours and after six hours an aeration time of 72 hours must be kept and then it can be used and the sterility is maintained for one year. So these are some of the instruments that we sterilize with ETO. Coming to the indicators, some of the indicators has been covered by my previous speaker. So these are the physical indicators, the strip which we use in autoclave in the surgical instrument trays and the gas is the one which we use in the ETO. The stickers are kept on the roll, which are on the packing material with which we pack the instruments. This is the Bowedic test, which is also used for checking the sterility of hollow tubings. The biological ampoules should be used for once in three months to know about the efficiency of the autoclaves. Operating room cleaning has been covered somehow a little bit by my previous speaker. Uh, so one important thing that I want to highlight here is the floor, the microscope, surfaces, all horizontal surfaces and the sinks should be cleaned daily and it should be documented. Now with what you want us to clean it, we, for us we are using bacillocid, mopping with bacillocid is what we do and for uh, fumigation is actually not so much preferred because formalin is a known carcinogenic but it is not contraindicated by AIOC, it is still allowed. So fumigation can be done, fogging is preferred but not mandatory. So for a running OT fumigation can be done once in a month. This is the three bucket technique that we use for cleaning the horizontal surfaces, the um, floors and the bed, surface of beds. For a startup OT, fumigation should be done on three consecutive days and then three negative cultures should be obtained. And for a running OT, periodic cultures once in three months should be taken. So from where do we take the sample? We should take the sample from the microscope, from the head end of the table and from air. And all this should be documented and you should maintain a file where we we'll keep all the culture reports. So these are some of the newer sterilizer or surface disinfectant, bacillosid, bacillol, and one latest one which has come in this uh, 2022 article is Vircon, which is also a surface disinfectant and it is recommended. It is, it is recommended for floor, wall, microscopes and all horizontal surfaces. It has uh, virucidal, bactericidal and fungicidal advantage. So I will not go into the details of cleaning protocols. It is there in our handout, which you can uh, collect from me. So something about the staff training, we need to train our staffs over and over again, maybe once in three months or once in six months about the OT sterilization by counseling, seminars, educational videos if necessary and also we need to periodically assess how well they are doing as Dr. Mathur has mentioned about those checklists, those should be maintained. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. So now I will call Dr. Himadri for his talk on intravitreal injection and medical management of endophthalmitis. Dr. Himadri is vitreoretina consultant from Assam, Chowdhury Eye Hospital and Research Center, Silchar. In case you people have any questions, there's no problem. You can shoot it right now because uh, these uh, topics are very important and practical. If you have anything which you feel if you have problems in your OT, please don't hesitate to ask. Tell me about uh, helix tube indicators. Sorry? Helix tube indicators. Helix tube indicators. Helix tube, yeah. 
Yeah, helix tube is for the sterilization yeah. testing. It is a B, indicator. B, B class indicator. Yeah, in, we are not doing it regularly, but this is uh, for the autoclave. How efficient is your autoclaving for that? If you have access to it, it should be done once in three months. Not for every cycle. No need of any every cycle, madam. Sorry. It should be done for every cycle or once a month. Every cycle, it is not necessary. Yeah. Thank you. A very good afternoon to one and all. At the very outset, I'd like to thank All India Ophthalmological Society, the Scientific Committee, and Dr. Haymanti for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking about endophthalmitis, medical management, and intravitreal injection, and I'll be just touching upon the surgical aspect as well. Uh, this is a picture we are all scared of after a very well done cataract surgery or a intraocular surgery. But once we are faced with it, we have to know how to manage it. So what are the goals of treatment? It is to kill the invading organism, arrest the damage caused by endotoxins and exotoxins, and also arrest the host inflammatory response. What options do we have? We have to go for antibiotics in multiple routes, uh, intraocular, intravitreal, topical, we have to go for a surg surgical intervention and use of corticosteroids. Now, what are the roots of intravitreal injection? Uh, roots of administration of antibiotics. Uh, intravitreal injection is the only surefire way to get the drug in the proper place, in the proper concentration. Topical drops and subconjunctival injection is not enough. And systemic medication can be given as we'll discuss in the subsequent slides. So most of our idea about management of endophthalmitis comes from the results of the EVS or endophthalmitis vitrectomy study, which was published way back in 1995. But one important caveat is, in EVS study, only cases with clear cornea enough to perform a pasplina vitrectomy was included. That means all patients with large corneal infiltrates, very virulent organisms were excluded. So what were the conclusions of the EVS study? They said that there is no role of systemic antibiotic treatment. Routine pars plena vitrectomy immediately is not required when the visual acuity is better than PL. And pars plena vitrectomy is of substantial benefit only for those who have a visual acuity of PL only. Okay, so systemic management has uh, systemic medications according to EVS has certain disadvantages. It prolongs the hospital stay, it increases the cost, and also has certain side effects. However, the ground reality is what's the deal? Ground reality is different, and uh, most ophthalmologists feel more secure using systemic antibiotics. Also, systemic medications prolong the duration of the minimum inhibitory concentration, and we have a better chance of killing the all viable organisms. Now, in a landmark study published in Survey of Ophthalmology, they spoke about the new modified protocol for EVS. Here, after a diagnosis of endophthalmitis was made, it was recommended to immediately go for a vitreous tap along with injection of intravitreal antibiotics. The Study also said that oral antibiotics had to be given. After the initial treatment, we have to wait for 24 hours for the initial assessment. And if there is a satisfactory response, we go ahead with the same treatment. However, in case of a poor response, there is no role of a repeat intravitreal injection. We have to go for a pars plena vitrectomy. These are the commonly used antibiotics for uh, systemic medication. We prefer ciprofloxacin, 750 milligram to 12 hourly. These are the organisms which cause uh, acute post-op endophthalmitis, that is coagulase negative staph and propionibacterium acnes causes delayed post-op endoph. There are certain indicators which point us to a very virulent organism where uh, we need to intervene aggressively. That is symptoms within two days of surgery, a vision of light perception, afferent pupillary defect, wound abnormalities, corneal infiltrate, and hypopian greater than 1.5 millimeter. 
Coming to the choice of intravitreal antibiotics, the first choice is vancomycin, and if for that works very well for gram positive organisms and for gram negative. Although the first choice is ceftazidine, but if we are suspecting a very aggressive gram negative organism, we can directly go for imipenem or piperacillin tazobactam combination. Most of the organisms are still, gram positive organisms are still act uh, with vancomycin, but for gram negative, ceftazidine, amikacin do not work that well, and we prefer piperacillin tazobactam or imipenem. So, in the studies which have published to show the organism profile from all around the world, it has been noted that the organism profile in India is slightly different from what is seen in the West. Here, we see a lot of gram-negative organisms, and among those gram-negative organisms, there is a high gram uh, resistance against amikacin and ceftazidim. So, in a suspected gram-negative organism, we should go directly with imipenem. Another entity which we should know about is endogenous fungal endophthalmitis, which uh, resulted after severe COVID-19 disease. Why we should know about it is because it might present as a non-infectious uveitis, and treating it with only corticosteroids will lead to worse prognosis. Now, vitreous biopsy is recommended and it is better than a TAP because it avoids retinal traction and it avoids a negative TAP. Alternatively, a AC TAP can be used. Single port vitreous biopsy is a very simple and easy procedure and all ophthalmologists should be able to perform it. It yields undiluted vitreous sample, especially when the visual acuity is better than PL and when PPV is not directly indicated and the organism profile is not very virulent. So these are the these are the instruments which we'll need for uh, vitreous tap. I'll be discussing the preparation of the individual drugs. Uh, vancomycin we need in a concentration of 1 milligram in 0.1 ml. It comes in many forms, either a 500 milligram or a 250 milligram vial. For 500 milligram, we use 10 milli milliliter of sterile water for injection. This is mixed very well with the 500 milligram vancomycin vial. And uh, one important thing to note is we have to keep changing the needles. We have to use a separate needle and 0.2 ml of the solution is withdrawn. This is because if we do not change the needle, some amount of drug stays in the hub and that can change the concentration. So again, using a new needle, we make it into 1 ml. It is mixed using various rotating motions and we use an air bubble that goes up and down and that helps in mixing it well. Again, the needle is changed to a 30 gauge needle and we only keep 0.1 ml. It is labeled and capped to know what injection it is. Next, moving on to preparation of septazidine. We require a concentration of 2.25 milligram in 0.1 ml. It comes in various form. I'll be discussing how to prepare from a one gram injection. 4.4 ml of sterile water for injection is mixed with one gram of septazidine. Again, we withdraw 0.1 ml of the solution using a new needle. The needle is changed. Sterile water is withdrawn to make it 1 ml. It is mixed using those rotating motions and allowing an air bubble to move up and down. Once we are convinced that it is mixed, we take a new needle and only keep 0.1 ml of the drug. Now moving on to the pr procedure, endophthalmitis is a pretty painful condition, so we have to do it under perivulvar anesthesia. One thing to remember is that we should not press on the globe after the anesthesia because these are post-op cases and there is a chance of a wound leak if we go for a massage. Dressing and draping is done in the usual fashion using povidone iodine. 
I'll now be showing how to prepare the vitrector. Almost all FACO machines come with a vitrector and we can use this vitrector for performing the vitreous tap, vitreous biopsy. The irrigation and aspiration lines are connected as directed in the machine. The infusion line, although connected, will not be used. The machine is primed in the usual fashion. We need this yellow adapter which comes with any IV cannula system. This is required for aspirating. It is connected to the aspiration line and we'll ask our assistant to withdraw. The irrigation is kept aside. Now coming back to the eye, you can use this trocar cannula system to measure 3.5 millimeter from the limbus. If you do not have access to a trocar cannula system, you can use a MVR blade. We make an entry into the globe and we have to first inspect whether the cutter is working or not prior to entering the vitreous cavity. After we enter the vitreous cavity, we start the cutting. Once we have done a little bit of a cutting, we ask our assistant to withdraw using the syringe. So this way we avoid all vitreous traction and we do not need too much of a sample. Only 0.5 ml sample is adequate and we should stop the moment we observe any amount of hypotony in the globe. This sample is kept aside and has to be sent for microbiological evaluation very quickly. We put it, put a needle and we have to bend the needle. Next, we go ahead with the intravitreal injections. We are using separate syringes for the injection because otherwise they form a coagulum if injected together. Injection has to be done slowly, drop by drop into the vitreous cavity. Once the injections are done, we remove the cannula and we should not hesitate to put a suture if we notice any amount of wound leakage. Always attempt to keep the globe slightly on the softer side. So with a vitreous tap, even very aggressive cases can work very well. Now, there are certain indications where we go directly for pars plana vitrectomy. These are cases where the organism is very highly virulent. Patient has a visual acuity of PL only. No response to the initial treatment with intravitreal injection. In post-traumatic cases and in fungal end of cases, we directly go for a pars plana vitrectomy. So, in pars plana vitrectomy, we use the usual 23 gauge or 25 gauge systems. It's very important to visualize the infusion cannula. If we need, we can clean up the anterior chamber a little bit if the visualization is not easy. Uh, we do not try to induce any PVD in most of the cases. In most cases, a uh, simple core vitrectomy is enough. We do not attempt to go to the periphery. We'll just be doing the core vitrectomy till we can visualize the optic disc and the macula. Once that is done, we tend to stop and go for the intravitreal injections. The infusion cannula and the other cannulas are removed. And at the end of the surgery, if we have any doubt, we can always put a suture. So this was a case of post-traumatic endophthalmitis and even post-traumatic endoph can have good results. Uh, this is an e-kit which comes from Oro. Uh, again, no financial interest. But this kit has all the necessary things for an intravitreal injection. And every anterior segment surgeon should at least have one of these in their armamentarium. Coming to the role of steroids, steroids definitely have a good role in bacterial endophthalmitis. However, we do not use them in cases of suspected fungal endoph. These are the microbiological workup necessary. In delayed post-op endophthalmitis, we have to go for a pars plana vitrectomy along with the capsulectomy. 
because with only injections they have a unacceptable high rate of recurrence so to summarize early diagnosis and management can save most eyes intravitreal vancomycin is good for gram positive organisms in suspected gram negative we have to go for imipenem and vitreous biopsy using a single port for microbiological workup should be done in all cases of suspected endophthalmitis and in patients who fail to respond to initial treatment a vitrectomy is a must thank you very much thank you dr himadri uh, if you have any questions from the house we'll be more happy to take it one important uh, point for those who came late about the pre operative uh, preparation a uh, drop of 5% povidone iodine in the conjunctival sac and a contact time of 3 minutes is very very useful for prevention of post operative infections it is a must and it should be done and painting with 10% povidone iodine and in the conjunctival sac 5% povidone iodine that is the um, concentration that is recommended so our next speaker is dr jalpa washi she is a senior nabh assessor she is a consultant in manipal hospital bangalore she will be speaking on nabh protocols in prevention and management of endophthalmitis so before jalpa starts this is one small thing as uh, was just shown to you for taking a sample from vitreous if you are an anterior segment surgeon don't get dissuaded that you cannot take an uh, do a paracentesis and take an aqueous sample because though the yield of the organism may be a little less but it is better than taking no sample at all uh so normally from an aqueous there is a positivity of about 40% from the vitreous about 50 to 60% from a good lab so always take a sample because an organismal diagnosis in every case of endophthalmitis is very important thank you thank you dr ahmadi for the opportunity good afternoon everyone end of thalmitis in first place none of us wants it but in case unfortunately if it happens then how many of us are prepared with proper documentation so let us uh, learn couple of nabh guidelines which would help us preventing infection by uh, following proper policies protocols checklist and also safeguard us with proper documentation in case of infection happens now who is responsible when infection happens whether it's operating surgeon ot nurse cssst in charge or all together consumables or it can be due to process failures also right it can be due to if validation of the you know sterilizer machines are not done or if indicators are not checked or in case of reuse of uh, instruments and multi dose vials the sterility is not maintained or it can be anti infection control program which would lay down all these policies so in nabh there are 10 chapters out of 10 four chapters will guide us regarding infection control policy documentation quality assurance and patient safety so let us learn couple of guidelines which would help us preventing infection so in surgery patient records this many points are mandatory the most important ones are pre operative assessment by the operating surgeon where you are supposed to mention about the negative history of an infection and systemic illness consent we know that is uh, this is the legal document it should be bilingual surgical safety checklist we'll discuss next operative notes implant details now the implant sticker which carries the details about the iols we are supposed to paste at three places one is discharge summary another one is uh, your uh, ot master log book and then in your in patient record post operative care plan which will mention about the antibiotics and discharge summary here we are supposed to mention about how and when to obtain an urgent care with contact details in the language which patient understands coming to surgical safety checklist this is an initiative by who in order to provide safety to all the patients who are undergoing surgery it has three section like sign in which is before induction of anesthesia time out before skin incision and sign out that is before patient leaves the operating room so this can be modified as per our need in sign in you check for patient's identity site of surgery procedure consent form 
In time out, the nursing team will check about the sterility of instruments and also ensure whether antibiotic is given as per profile axis. And sign out is all about documentation and IO labels. Operation theater, Dr. Hemanth has already discussed. Avoid a mix of sterile and unsterile stuff. There should be a safe usage and sharing of consumables. So, say we use BSS uh, in four or five patients while operating. So, in each patient's case sheet, we are supposed to mention about the batch number of the BSS. This will help us in recall process. Efficacy of the OT cleaning and disinfection practices can be ensured with uh, OT cultures. And OT cultures has to be taken once a month. If there is a heavy patient load, then twice a month. Daily HU log should be maintained. Daily monitoring of humidity, temperature, pressure differential inside the OT should be measured. The integrity of the HU filter should be checked periodically. Now we uh, believe that the, when the indicator, uh, the color of indicator is changed, that means the process is completed. But it is not so. It uh, it just says that process is completed. It doesn't say that whether machine has. Uh, given or uh, provided enough uh, amount of temperature or pressure for enough amount of time. So to validate the machine, we are supposed to use Bovidic test. This is for the autoclave before starting first load. And biological indicator is must as per the NABG guidelines and it has to be once in 15 days. Coming to multi-dose vials like uh, antibiotics, mitomycin C, anti-VEGF, here we are supposed to mention the date of opening when the vial is open, SOP has to be made for multi-dose vials and we must ensure safe storage once the vials are open. Now, hospital has to design an infection control program which would include these following points like say standard and universal precautions where we mention about hand hygiene, safe injection practice, needle stick injuries, spillage. Uh, post exposure profile axis, we also have to define high risk areas. We need to define cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization protocol. Surveillance activities like cultures of OTs and um, validation of sterilizer machine. Risk identification and management, we'll discuss this. Antibiotic policy, where we uh, mention about the rational use of antibiotics, reuse of policy. Budget. Hospital must have dedicated budget for hospital infection control practices, which demonstrate the uh, commitment of management towards the same. KPIs, that is key performance indicators that will help us monitoring all these hospital infection control practices. Uh, say for example, adherence to hand hygiene and training. Repeated training on these practices must be given to all the staff. Now, hospital must have infection control nurse. This nurse will take care of training part and oversee all the uh, infection control practices. Uh, hospital should also have infection control team and uh, microbiologist should be a, one of the member of this team. This team will uh, make all the policies and infection control committee. This committee will review all these policies and um, will meet once in uh, uh, once in four months. This committee will also discuss if any untoward uh, uh, adverse event has happened. Uh, now, what is risk reduction protocol? This is to minimize the chance of infection in the eye. So, what all points are included here? Like we take extra care when we operate high-risk surgeries, patient with HIV positive. Here, we also need to include pre-operative antibiotic protocol, preparation of patient before surgery, care during surgery, post-operative care in terms of antibiotics, should follow-up, early detection of surgical site infection, stringent OT etiquette for staff and doctors, disinfection protocol before, in between, after surgery, surveillance protocol, KPIs and OT infrastructure as per NABH guidelines. So reuse policy, this is meant for instruments like FACO tip sleeves, vitrectomy cutter, cassettes. So we are supposed to make SOP on this and uh, list out all the items, how many times we can use them, mark the item after each use, and there should be a policy to discard early found damage. So we know we have to maintain so many registers in OT. The most important ones are OT culture reports, then uh, your indicator uh, records, validation records, consumables, OT master logbook with implant details, AHU maintenance record, checklist for OT disinfection, OT cleaning record, which can be daily in between terminal and so on. So coming to management, uh, end of thermite is also known as surgical site infection. 
And what is surgical site infection? So as per CDC definition, it is an infection occurs within 30 days after surgery if no implant is left or within one year if implant is in place. So what is the protocol? We know that we have to completely recall all the patients, instruments and consumables after sealing the OT, observe other patients operated on the same day. We need to check sterilization sticker, re-sterilize all the items. We need to check all the consumables, inform the vendor, OT disinfection, once again go for culture reports and uh, validation of all the machines with biological indicators and consent, this is legal document, so again go through the consent form whether it's duly filled or not. And finally, the most important thing is detailed documentation of processes, investigations and treatment given. So this endophthalmitis is known as an incident in uh, an ABH terms and any incident we have to report. After reporting incident, we have to do root cause analysis and after doing root cause analysis, we have to take some corrective measures and preventive measures. So root cause analysis can be done with various methods. We'll discuss two of them. One is five my method where you keep asking why till you arrive at the conclusion. So say infection happened. Why infection happened? Because protocol was not followed. Why it was not followed? Because there was a lack of awareness. So finally, you come to conclusion that there was a lack of communication and callous attitude by the staff. Now, what is the remedy for this? It is by only training. Frequent training is required. Another method is fishbone analysis, where you further break down all these uh, causes, say breach in sterilization, so no validation had happened. You go for inefficient uh, disinfection where dilution protocol was not defined, AHU was failed, or contaminated solution where the expired drug were used or visible dirt was not observed. So after RCA, we have to take some corrective actions and we know that is treatment, surveillance and recall of medicine consumables and all and preventive actions. So what could be the preventive actions? There would be a policy change, change in cleaning disinfection, sterilization protocol, change in consumables, change your supplier. You need to give alert to your colleagues, document the entire process and during committee meetings, we are supposed to discuss all these things and there should be staff training on new policies and procedure. And most important thing is review of this training effectiveness by repeated internal audits and assessments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chalpa. Uh, is, are there any questions which we can answer? Because we have come to the last presentation. This is by, the, by Dr. Ajay Arora, who is the chief consultant of Vision Plus Eye Center, Noida. He is an innovator himself. He is a very prolific vitreoretinal surgeon, and he'll be speaking on surgical management of endophthalmitis. Anybody from the audiovisual is here? So while he is just connecting, uh, it's, uh, I had a question for you, Jalpa, that you said a microbiologist is required. Uh, do we have to have a microbiologist uh, attached to the hospital or how? For, for analyzing? Uh, not necessary, sir. You can outsource. See, you must have, but outsource, uh, you must have MOU with that patho lab okay. and with that doctorate pathologist or microbiologist so i'll be talking on the surgical management of endophthalmitis uh, when uh, to do vitrectomy and endophthalmitis the rationale timing and technique so we would all prefer to have our cataract surgeries end up like this and not a disaster like that so my presentation would be to look at the indications for vitrectomy, how much of vitrectomy we must do, what one should avoid while doing a vitrectomy. This is a little older video, but I'll just 
share that uh, we should use a variable by anesthesia when you have a situation like this you can uh, put in an ac maintainer um, uh, remove uh, sometimes you have a fibrin pupillary membrane and at times uh, i've had two such instances where i removed the pupillary membrane did an indirect on the table and found that the vitreous was not too bad went ahead and gave intravitreal antibiotics so must do an indirect if you already know that there's a lot of exudation in the vitreous obviously then you go ahead and do the vitrectomy clear the vitreous debris uh, from behind the lens we always prefer if you have a large amount of uh, exudation we put in a 6 mm infusion uh, cannula so i'll just speed it up a little bit and then we go ahead and do the so we now uh, very few instances we use a sutured cannulas but uh, this is since a little older video we still use whenever we are using a 6 mm cannula we use a sutured cannula this is another situation where we do a cold vitrectomy so i have this device of my own which is uh, used for intravitreal injections this also has got marks so it fixates the globe i do not have to measure it with any caliper and uh, one can do the vitrectomy uh, uh, which means we can fixate the globe and and so you must identify the cannula that it is intravitreal uh before you st- uh, put the cannula on uh you do the cold vitrectomy it is not necessary to induce a pvd but if the pvd is already there it can be extended without uh, causing any further traction to the retina the um, uh, mrvs cutters posterior cortical vitreous may be trimmed if the pvd is not there and in case the uh, exudation is very uh, extensive sometimes you can uh, do a cold vitrectomy and you do not, are not able to get visualization of the disc you can abandon it and do it at a second stage give the intravitreal antibiotics and suddenly realize that and there there have been some rare instances where we have done like that and we have succeeded in the end so the indication for past plana vitrectomy is when there is light perception of light uh, light perception only but nowadays we are p- uh, intervening much earlier when the infection is very virulent and is progressive a delayed onset endophthalmitis a fungal endophthalmitis a recurrent endophthalmitis endophthalmitis with retinal detachment endophthalmitis associated with a corneal puff and endophthalmitis with an intraocular fallen body so uh, as has been shown before how do you collect a sample uh, before we start our vitrectomy we definitely would like to collect a sample and therefore we connect a syringe with the cutter aspiration port start cutting and it is removed now how does vitrectomy basically work it works because it takes material for culture there is reduction of toxins and organisms there is clearing up of the media there is a uniform antibiotic distribution and the final fight is basically of antibiotics and the body's defense system rather than your vitrectomy alone so it's very important that you should finally be able to reach an organismal diagnosis so that you can treat the endophthalmitis well some examples here this is a situation of a acute endophthalmitis which was treated um, uh, and there are three situations where patients did well Uh, this is a patient with p acnes so this is a gram positive anaerobic bacillus which is uh, commensal in the conjunctival sac so it can present uh, a little delayed with a plaque like situation most cases uh, we are able to handle it without removing the lens we can do a capsulectomy give a bag wash do a vitrectomy so that all the bag wash can also be removed from vitrectomy but in some situations you may have to remove the lens in those cases you have to remove the entire lens and do a capsulectomy so these patients usually do well 
In cases of fungal enterocinitis, they can present with more signs than symptoms. So these are uh, cases where we did an AC wash, vitrectomy, intravitreal injection of voriconazole, and intracameral injection of voriconazole. Uh, in the third case, we did an additional removal of the lens, and patient did well. So this is a patient with a fungal endothermitis which uh, grew aspergillus on a cerebral dextrose agar. And so it's very important eventually to be associated with a good lab so that you can reach uh, um, the diagnosis. This was a patient with an entrocular foreign body where it grew pseudo boidy. body. We had, we had to do almost like a radical vitrectomy. Uh, just fell short of injecting silicon oil and the, uh, it was useful. And, and uh, RD is actually uncommon in cases of endothelitis, but in post-traumatic cases or when there is fishing done for removal of a dropped lens, dropped IOL, then an RD can occur. In these cases, we have to do a belt buckle vitrectomy or, uh, with a vitreous-based dissection and silicon oil injection. So before you inject the silicon oil, at the end of fluid air exchange, we inject antibiotics and uh, go ahead and do a laser photocoagulation. In uh, uh, one-eyed patients, keratoplastis is followed by paspilana vitrectomy with therapeutic PK can be done. Um, and so this is uh, uh, a case which was presented by, uh, by, by Dr. Das's group, which was very interesting. Uh, that's why I thought I include it. It's a 38-year-old male presented with total loss of vision after injury. Patient had a cornea tear repair, pass plan, and insectomy, vitrectomy, intraocular foreign body removal. So here it is interesting it that uh, after having uh, used dexamethasone initially, on the fourth day they use intravital tramsulone. Tramsulone is a long-lasting steroid, basically to show you that the inflammatory uh, component in the endothelitis is important to manage it. And now they are coming up with a, a detailed inflammatory scoring of patient of, in, of endothelitis, which will be important. Now, after intravitreal injection for Avastin, uh, it requires an urgent vitrectomy, and I'll just show you some interesting cases. This is a 45-year-old type 2 diabetic patient who had an intravitreal injection of Avastin. Post-op day one, patients uh, uh, underwent vanco with microbiology. Um, uh, did not respond after 48 hours. There was a re vitrectomy with Vanco and Amikacin. Um, Dr. Ashish had initially seen it. And a second opinion was sought. Patient undergoes a second re vitrectomy in Vodiconazole. Sample was sent for PCR. This uh, patient grew Bacteroides fragilis. Patient was given imipenem. Patient responded the next day. So again, I'm stressing that an organismal diagnosis is important because the fight is with the appropriate antibiotic in these cases. This is uh, another patient where Vancotazubac was given. Patient had an increase in hypopian after 24 hours. Patient received imipenem. Again, the microbiology was negative. A patient uh, we uh, sent in a, uh, uh, a sample for PCR. Patient uh, we detected pseudomonas aeruginosa. Patient was treated with cholestin and patient again responded to it. This is an old case. Some of you may have seen this part of my presentation. So this is a 63 years old female whom I followed now for almost uh, 12 years. Uh, she underwent pasplan and vitrectomy. I operated upon her way back in 2009, injected vancoceptazidine. There was no growth. Then we lost her to follow up. She received at other places 14 injections of intraocular antibiotic, vancoceptazidine, multiple injections of avastin for DME. Patient was culture uh, and PCR negative. Cytology was negative. PET CT was negative. Patient then came back to me six years later with a recurrent inflammation. Patient had also received methotrexate for um, a, a non-infectious uveitis, which was not responding. So when the patient came back, uh, she was uh, a lady, frail lady, she said, and she still had an IOL in place. 
and she told me that please don't do not remove my lens uh, if you wish whatever you want to do you do so for me what was important is i had to reach an organismal diagnosis patient had already been operated vitrectomy done how do i get a sample from the vitreous so the only place i thought i can get a sample from the vitreous is from the zonular area so what we did was we took a long 32 gauge uh, sorry 26 gauge 32 mm long needle bent it over the uh, uh, over the 50 cc syringe because once you bend it like this it takes the curvature which you can use it on inject uh, you know so we the, wanted to take a sample from the zonules it was already a vitrectomized eye we went in and took a sample from the zonules and while we were doing that we realized that there was some amount of yellowish material exudation coming in the anterior chamber we went in to the anterior chamber again took the sample from the angle and this sample was then sent to shang uh, to the uh, sn lab for pcr and exciton in bangalore and then we went ahead and did the vitrectomy in these cases the uh, lab in sn on a nested pcr group p acnes the exciton uh, revealed fusarium we were again confused but we treated the patient for both so it's again i'm saying that these uh, patients i uh, it's important to treat them aggressively treat them for the organism which you detect and that is very important before i conclude let me show you for the comprehensive ophthalmologists for the limited people who are sitting now is that you could use uh, i have a device which we made for giving intravitreal injections whenever we giving an intravitreal injections invariably the patient may keep moving the eye and we do it under topical anesthesia we give uh, provident iodine so this device has got an under surface which is got sort of like appearance it has got a hole at about 3.75 mm from the limbus it has got a valvular entry so you can see the globe is very steady i don't need a caliper i don't need a fixation for sep and with this you will never ever touch the lens because you can't move anteriorly you will never ever touch the retina because you can't move posteriorly so we have two this two devices this one and this two models which we eventually have finalized so this works very well uh just to recap that uh, in indian circumstances we have higher incidence of gram negative organisms as compared to what was reported by gram uh, by evs study and this has been shown by multiple studies all over the country over time so it is important to choose one gram positive organism a uh, one gram positive antibiotic like vancomycin and one gram negative please remember in last 17 years of practice in the country the uh, vancomycin resistance has increased from 4 to 6% while the resistance to ceftazidime has increased by almost 60 to 70% therefore most people now we are using vancomycin and tazobact or sometimes even imipenem so it is important to have these tables put up in your operation theater you should know and there is no need to understand what dilution you are going to use you should only know what is the final concentration you are going to inject in the vitreous cavity and that is what is important so the take home message is please please take all steps to prevent endophthalmitis from occurring differentiate tas from endophthalmitis when in doubt always err on the site uh, uh, site of infection use intravitreal antibiotics early if suspecting bacterial use steroids systemic antibiotics do complement intraocular antibiotics timely and judicious vitrectomy is important must document all findings talk to the patient and family and do not hesitate to take an opinion or refer to your colleague remember it's important to save the eye and save yourself so you should uh, consider an early vitrectomy use a good cutter you can use a 6 mm infusion cannula do not have to induce a pvd and in case one needs to go close to the retina reduce the suction and cut um, uh, thank you thank you for the opportunity for this course and um, uh, if you people have any questions we will be most happy to answer them
Thank you very much, Dr. Ajay Arora. That was really insightful. So with this, we have come to the end of this IC. As I said, we have some handouts which you can collect from me for the whole proceedings of this instruction course. And uh, now the valedictory function is about to start. Yes, sir. If you have any question, yes, sir, please.